getting calls on this Lord's Prayer series. I got a call last night all the way from Ontario saying, Kevin, what's your YouTube channel? And I thought about it. Probably many people don't even know what our YouTube channel is. So if you go to YouTube, I don't know what our YouTube channel is. It's, uh, but if you Google, uh, in YouTube, you search Saskatoon Grace Life Center, you will find all of our messages, all right? including this series, last week's number one, this is number two in the Lord's Prayer. And, and I'm excited to share this with you tonight uh, because God's got some good things for us. Where's our, where's our, uh, our operator? There we go, the Lord's Prayer. And we're doing this in the words of Jesus. The Lord's Prayer in the words of Jesus. And let me just uh, explain, there's a lot of you here la that weren't here last week. And uh, that was because some of the roads, in fact, the only people from out of town last week were the Peters, uh, me, and, and Tina, and Ethan. Everybody else was from Saskatoon that was here last week. And uh, the roads weren't that good. But uh, the, the Lord's Prayer in the words of Jesus. You see, Jesus, when he lived on this earth, would have spoke in Aramaic. And when they translated uh, uh, the Lord's Prayer, when Matthew was writing, he wrote Matthew in Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek. You knew that. Or may, some of you might not have known that. But the New Testament was written in Greek. And so there's some words in the Aramaic that didn't translate good into Greek. Just like there's some words that don't translate good into English. We don't have words for them. And I explained to you last week, for example, the word love. Love has four Greek words. You've got phileo, agape, eros, and uh, I forgot the fourth one. Phileo, agape, eros, and what? F phileo. Phileo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Philadelphia, brotherly love. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and uh, so there's four Greek words. So when we say, for example, I love my dog, how many know that you don't love your dog the same way you love your kid? And you don't, you know, you, or the same way that you love your wife. Or, so we use this word love, and it's only one word in our English language, but it's actually separated into four different words in the Greek language. And so there's, we're going to go into the Aramaic. What was the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic, and how would Jesus have said it, and what would it have meant in Aramaic? Because if you actually study the Greek uh, version of this and uh, you go for example in Matthew chapter 6 that's where the Lord's prayer is it's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount Matthew 5 6 and 7 in Matthew chapter 6 when it says our father if you look that up in the Greek it means parent all right and we learned last week that our father actually you're getting ahead of me I'm not even there yet there that's what it means in the in the Aramaic all right we're gonna get there O thou from whom the breath of life comes so uh, be, just before we get going, though, let's pray. And I want to lift up Wes. Uh, Wes. Wes's dad passed away. This Grandpa, sorry. Yeah, uh, let me get that right. Wes's grandpa passed away this last week, and tonight is the viewing of the body, and tomorrow is the funeral. So Wes can't be here with us tonight. He's gone to the funeral home to be with his family. Will you uh, join me in praying for Wes tonight? Father, we just thank you for Wes. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you've got a, a, a great calling on his life and that he is a light because you live in him. And so tonight, as they are at the funeral home uh, viewing the body and having a little service for his grandpa, I pray that your spirit uh, would be uh, really evident there. I know your spirit is there, but that your spirit would be manifested in that place and that uh, Wes would just be a light uh, in that whole room to his family. We thank you, Lord, for the life of his grandpa, and uh, we just give you glory and honor for the heritage uh, that came through grandpa down to Wes's parents and to Wes and, he, and now to his family. And Father, for this message tonight, I just pray that our hearts would be open to receive what you have for us. I thank you, Lord, that we have, uh, you've given us minds that we can hear and understand and that you are uh, challenging our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, are you ready to receive tonight? Would you do me the honor of standing with me and let us recite the Lord's Prayer together? Amen? Now, you'll know this, and uh, so it's not on the screen, but as we say it, uh, you're going to learn a little bit more about what we're actually saying as we go through the messages. Let's say it together. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, you may be seated. You know, one of the, the problems with the, this verse that really threw me off for a long time, actually up until about three weeks ago, it's the very verses after the Lord's Prayer. We say the Lord's Prayer, but you know what the very verses after the Lord's Prayer say? Listen to this. Oops, I got to go back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, it says this. Now, you got to remember, this is the words of Jesus. For if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. That's horrible, isn't it? I mean, it, was, it, it really bothered me. In fact, I, I, after I found some better thinking about God, I would skip that part of the Bible. In Mark chapter 11, it says the same thing. But, uh, you know, there, there's some things that we just don't understand. For, the, for, the, uh, uh, for example, the word forgive, as in the Lord's Prayer, actually means untie the fetters. Or uh, in English, it's untie the chains that bind us as we forgive, the, uh, as we untie the chains that we bind others in. We're talking about forgiveness and unforgiveness and bitterness. And all of us, and I want to make this clear to you, I, I was really struggling with words. And so I really hope that this is very clear to you, that when it says here, if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, uh, then your Father will not forgive tra your transgressions. What it really means is this, God will not counteract your will. If you want to hold a grudge, you can. And God just doesn't take it away. He's saying, if I can't untie your chains miraculously, you have to choose to forgive. Now, am I making some sense here? He's saying, if you forgive others, or if you untie those chains, and when we're talking about forgiveness here, we're not, uh, we'll explain it maybe a little bit more in the series, we're not even really talking about sin. We're talking about transgressions against us. When somebody's done something against us, or something, but he's just made me mad. And so it's talking about when I untie that in my life, or what it's really saying is, if you don't untie it, in your life, if you do not forgive, God can't do it for you. Now it makes a little bit more sense, doesn't it? It's not talking about if you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. Because we know in Colossians that he says, you've already been forgiven. He already says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far I've removed your sins from you. In Hebrews he says that he died one time once for all sin for all time. One time, for all sin, for all time, it's already gone. So that can't be what it means. But how many know that we live in this life and sometimes people do things to us and we just kind of get a little twisted? And so what, the, what Jesus is saying, if you don't forgive, if you don't choose to forgive, if you don't untwist that, God can't do it. Understand? Understand? I'm really struggling with how to clearly say this, but we're going to go a little bit farther into the Lord's Prayer today. And, uh, and so uh, God has good things in mind for you. So this is our second message. And, uh, you know, I want to say that I appreciate all the comments, the texts, the calls uh, from some of you and others that have been listening uh, regarding last week's message. And I know some of you went and researched uh, more on the pr Lord's Prayer yourself. And because uh, I've had texts from a couple of people saying, wow, I didn't know all this in Aramaic, all right? Uh, but before I was introduced to grace, this, the Lord's Prayer used to just mess me right up. And when I think about it now, uh, I taught it a whole different way. I can't believe that I used to teach it this way. And would you believe that on my way to Melfort this morning, I turned on the radio to listen to some Christian programming, and for two programs in a row, they're talking about the Lord's Prayer. And guess what? They are talking about it the way I used to talk about it, all right? And, and so this is how we, I used to uh, go through uh, Western uh, English eyes on the Lord's Prayer. 
And the Bible wasn't written in Western culture. It was written in Eastern culture, and it wasn't written in English, all right? So I used to teach the Lord's Prayer as an outline. Here, here's an outline for you to pray. You know, our Father who art in heaven. So we would say, our Father. Oh, you know what? You need to recognize who you're praying to. This is what I used to do, okay? I don't do this as of three weeks ago and uh, probably a little bit longer because I haven't taught on it for so long. So our Father, you've got to recognize who you're talking to. He's your dad. He's your Abba, da-da-da-da-da. You know, and then uh, who art in heaven? And then, uh, you know, while he's up there, we're down here. God's in heaven, you know, different things like that. And hallowed be thy name. Well, you know, I got I to gotta butter up God because I'm about to ask for something, right? And it's like going to your dad and, you know, when my kids come to me and if they say, oh, dad, you know, you're the most handsome guy in the world. I know they're not lying, but they're telling me this anyways, right? And they're saying, you're the most handsome guy in the world. And dad, I just love you so much. And Zoe comes and she kisses me on the cheek. And then the next thing she is, can I have $5 to go to the store? You know, she's buttered me up to get something instead of coming and saying, Dad, can I have $5? And I'm like, no. She's buttering me up so that when she asks, I can't refuse, right? And so that's how we've used an outline of the Lord's Prayer for, for God. You know, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And I'm about to ask for st stuff, right? Give us this day our daily of bread and forgive me of my sins. And sadly, there are many who teach this outline principle. And for two programs today, I listened because they were talking about the Lord's Prayer. It's exactly what they had, this outline principle of the Lord's Prayer. But when we dig deeper, we find this beautiful message that we've missed out on. The Lord's Prayer is more than just a prayer. It is actually honor and worship. And, and it should leave us, the Lord's Prayer should really leave us with a sense of awe of who God is. Which, really, we've said it so many times, it doesn't do that anymore. We're just, we just say it, right? But it should leave us, with, leave us with a sense of awe of who God is. And this is the reason we're studying the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. Now, I told you before. But can somebody remind me why we're studying the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic? I just told you. Anybody at all? Anybody brave enough to speak out? That's right, because that's the language Jesus spoke. Uh, and that's why we're studying it in Aramaic. So we also said last Sunday, now if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, there's a Sermon on the Mount, it's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, we said this last week, 17 times God is revealing, sorry, Jesus is revealing God as Father. 17 times in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. If, God's, if Jesus said it once, it would be pretty important. But he says it 17 times in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. 10 times Jesus uses the word your Father as a group. And we talked about last week that there would have been believers, Jews that were believers, Jews that were unbelievers, Jews that wanted to kill him. There would have been Gentiles there because every time a Jewish crowd gathered, there would have been Roman soldiers that came to make sure that there wasn't a, a great big uprising from the Jews. They wanted to know what's happening. And so when Jesus said, your father, he was talking to believers, unbelievers, Jews, and Gentiles. All right? And he's using it as a, a group, your father who is in heaven. All right? Five times in the King James Version, it uses the word, thy father. In other versions, it says, your father. But we use your in, in the English language as both singular and plural pronouns. So if you came to me and, and I had my brother and sister up here and you said, Kevin, your dad wants you, you've just made that pronoun singular. So five times it's a singular. So he's, Jesus is saying, God is your personal father. All right? That's five times. One time he says, our father. Guess what Jesus did? He just identified with you, himself with you as man. And then in the very end, in, in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 21, I believe it is, he says, my father. So he's your father, he's our father, he's uh, my father, Jesus says, but he's all of our fathers. So it's personal, it's plural, it's, it's everywhere, right? And so when we say our father, we automatically think of a parent. God is like a father or a parent to us, right? But when Jesus said our father, he's saying that God is more than just a father. Jesus would have said, used the word abuan, all right? Abuan, father. 
which means, O thou from whom the breath of life comes. And father meant so much more than just a parent. Father is recognizing that my very existence is dependent on a force that is greater than I. That my very existence is dependent on father. You've given me breath. Every breath I take comes from God. And uh, uh, God breathed his breath into man in, in Genesis chapter 2. And man becomes a living soul. So every breath you take, whether you're a believer or a non-believer today, I don't care who you are, you're breathing in God's breath. It's God's breath in you. God's breath in us. Every time we say our Father, we're acknowledging God's life in us. In revealing God as Father, the message of Jesus is that uh, we talked about this last week too, is God's desire is relationship. God doesn't want to be up there and you here. All right, we're going to talk about separation in a minute. But it's a family relationship. It's the strongest relationship you can have. And Jesus says God is your Father. It is family. That God is not separated from us, as many still teach, but that God is with us. And after our Father comes who art in heaven. Isn't that right? Our Father who art in heaven. Now I want to show you the Aramaic for uh, who art in heaven is the, in the next slide, please. It's this. I, hopefully I get this right. Uh, Debwash, uh, Debwash Maha. Debwash Maha. I had it right yesterday, but I forgot it this morning and I forgot it tonight. Uh, Debwash Maha, right? And uh, it means who fills all realms of sound, light, and vibration. Our Father who art in heaven. But really what it is, it, is, it fills all realms. The one, our Father who gives us breath and you fill all realms with sound, light, and vibration. Now that changes things a little bit, doesn't it? When we say our Father who art in heaven, in our English understanding, what happens is that we have just given God a place. He's up there and I'm here on earth. That's, that's his place, you know. And what happens in our minds is this. Heaven is somewhere out there, or it might be somewhere up there. We don't know where it is, but that's, that's not where we are. And do you know what that does? It actually causes separation from heaven and from earth. Separation between man and God. For example, if I said tonight, my father who is in Prince Albert... How many know that right now, my father, who is in Prince Albert, is separated from me by about 90 miles, right? He's separated from me. And so in our, in our Western thinking, in our English language, we have caused this separation that God never intended us to have. And so uh, it, uh, for, uh, let me go on here. So what happens is we use our natural reality, what we knew, know to be true in the natural, and we apply it to the spiritual realm. But that's not a proper interpretation, and it's not God. Because anything that brings separation between you and God is not the gospel. I know that's new thinking to you, isn't it? Anything that causes separation, or that's not taught in, in a lot of churches, anything that causes separation between you and God is not the gospel. What does the Bible say? If you look in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, it says this. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Another translation says, He will not leave you or forsake you. And you know what? The writer of Hebrews quotes that verse. And in Hebrews 13, 5, it says, For God himself, for God himself has said, I will never desert you. I will not forsake you. What's the, the, do you have the next slide in Hebrews 13, 5? Let's see here. God himself says, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Who said it? According to Hebrews, who said it? God did. And if God said it, guess what? It's got to be true because God's not a liar. And if God said he will never leave you or forsake you, guess what? He won't. 
And guess what? That means there is no separation between you and God, no matter where you go, because he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You cannot be separated from me. In fact, if you go uh, to Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, it says this. This mystery, there's a mystery. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So now we've got Christ not only with us, not never leaving us or forsaking us, but he is in us. Guess what? That's pretty hard to be separated from God, isn't it? You cannot separate whatever's in you from out of you and live and survive. And, and God says, I am in you. I am not separated from you. I am with you always. No matter where you go, I am there. But we tend to separate God from man, heaven from earth. And the truth is, you absolutely can't. We live on earth, but earth is not outside the heavens or the heavenly, or another word would be the cosmos. Cosmos. Earth is included in the heavens and in the heavenly. And we know that, for example, we have angels. You know, I, uh, my brother-in-law is here tonight, and my sister's not. But when I was two and a half years old, I don't even know this story. I was told this story, all right? I was about two and a half years old. My mom had uh, many problems having uh, children. In fact, I had an older brother that they said if he lived a certain amount of time, he was born premature, he would live. But uh, the day after he, he survived that amount of time, he died. When, and uh, had many miscarriages. Then she had me, God looked in the womb and said, this is good, I'm going to make sure he survives, right? I, I, you're not laughing. Yeah, yeah I'm good. <laughs> and, uh, and so my mom had me. And uh, then I had a brother, and when I was about two and a half years old, I came out of my bedroom, and I said, guess what? We're going to have another baby. It's going to be a girl, and we're going to name her Janan. And they said, who told you that? I said, well, an angel did in my bedroom. And uh, I remember sitting on my grandparents' knee when I was just about four years old, because there's two years between me and my brother and four years between my, me and my sister. Uh, I won't tell you how old she is, but I'm 43, all right? Uh, and so there's four years between my sister and I, and uh, my grandma and grandpa are at our house, and they're trying to convince me that it could be a boy. And I'm like, nope, it's a girl. And guess what? It was a girl. We named her Janan. We found out years later from a Jewish uh, missionary that Janan is a Jewish name that means beautiful. We didn't know that. So we know that there's this heavenly realm that's, that's actually activated on earth right now. That we, even on earth, we're in the heavenly realm. You can't separate heaven from earth. And, of course, there's the demonic, for that matter, at work and affecting things and people on earth. But look how Jesus answered the Pharisees about the kingdom of heaven. All right, we talk about the kingdom of heaven. We think about it up there. Here's what uh, Jesus answered the Pharisees in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. The King James Version says, the kingdom of God is within you. And if you look up this word uh, in my translation, I use the New American Standard, in your midst, it actually means in the middle of you. Yeah, we think about the kingdom of God is in your midst. We think it's Jesus. Well, that's partially true, but where does Jesus live? He's in you. So the kingdom of God is not just in your midst. The kingdom of God is in the middle of you. You can't separate the, the, the kingdom of heaven from the kingdom of, from the realm of earth, can you? It's all one. Uh, and so when we say our Father who art in heaven, we're saying there is no separation between God and man, heaven or earth. And he, so we, we say it in the Aramaic. It says, O thou from whom the breath of life comes, who fills all realms with sound, light, and vibration. How many know that God is not just in the heavenly realm? It is in all realms. God is in our realm. And guess what? He is in your personal realm as well. Whatever realm you're in, God is there. You know, in uh, Philippians, Paul wrote that Jesus came, and he came in the likeness of men. He came in a man body to live in this earthly realm. God became flesh. But did that stop Jesus from being God? Absolutely not. 
Because you cannot separate God and man, the heavenlies and the earthlies. I know we like to. It brings clarity to our minds, but it's just not there. It's all one realm. And the world we live in is filled with sound and light and vibrations. There's all sorts of vibrations going on right now. Right now, there's a vibration of sound from my voice. But how many know if you walk out the building and you go to walk a few steps down, you won't hear that vibration anymore? But right in this room, there's vibrations that you are not even aware of. There are radio vibrations that if we had a tuner, we could tune in to different radio frequencies that are in this room right now. And there's television frequencies in this room right now. There's satellite frequencies in this room right now. In fact, most of you have cell phones. There's cell phone service in here right now, right? All these vibrations. There's even Wi-Fi in here, vibrations that, that, you, that are picked up but when you have the proper antenna I want you to know that you could leave this place and you can uh, leave the sound of my voice but you can't get away from the vibration of God or the God's voice you could go where there's no cell service no radio service no TV service no satellite no not nothing's there and guess what God is right there with you you can't he's always there because guess what you're still living and every time you breathe you cause a vibration that means he's right there. You could go, you, you, uh, Romans uh, says it this way. He fills all realms. Uh, let me see. I, I'm getting ahead of myself, I think. Well, let's go to Romans. Let's, oh, I'm not in Romans yet. Let's, let's go back to my notes, all right? Where is Romans? Maybe I missed it. Romans chapter 8. Oh, I, I know what I, I didn't even go there. In Romans chapter 8, he says, What can separate you from the love of God? Can heaven or hell or earth or mountains or the depths of the sea? Anything. And the answer is there is absolutely nothing that can separate you from God. And it says the love of God. 1 John 4 says God is Love. Say it like you mean it now. God is that way. That means you cannot be separated from God because God is love. And you can't be separated from the love of God. So where there's love, there's God. Did I say that too fast? You cannot be separated from God. We do it in our minds, but God doesn't do it. God uh, is in all sound and light and vibration. He fills all these realms. And this is the God that Jesus was talking about. This is the God that Jesus was teaching us to pray to. This relational God who fills the atmosphere with his presence. If you want to know if God's with you, the answer is yes. Because you're in some presence. You're in an atmosphere. You can't go to the moon because you're in an atmosphere and not be where God is. You can't go to Mars and not be without God because there's an atmosphere there. You're always, he fills the atmosphere. He fills the cosmos. Isn't that amazing that the Lord's Prayer teaches us that? Let's go to the next one. Hallowed be thy name. Let me try this. Hallowed be thy name is Neth Kadash Shmak. Shmak, not Shmak. So not smuck, smock, okay? It's Neth Kadash, smock. And it means, may your light be experienced in my inner, or sorry, in my utmost holiest. May your light be experienced in my utmost holiest. I love this. See, John has a lot to say about Jesus being the light. He is light, right? Uh, in... In fact, it says, in him was life, and this life was the light of men. If you have Christ's life in you, you have light. This light experienced in my utmost holiness. Jesus is praying. He's praying that we would know uh, more than God has just given us breath, more than that God is just with us and surrounds us. When we pray, hallowed be thy name, we are asking that we would experience God. Isn't that awesome? O thou, from whom my very breath of life comes, 
You fill the realms of light, sound, and vibration. I want to experience you in my utmost holiest. That's what hallowed be thy name means. That's how Jesus would have said it. And we're asking that we would experience God in the deepest part of my being. Father, let us experience your light in the deepest part of my being. Why? Because God wants to change you. He wants to transform you. He wants your mind to be renewed, to think like him. He wants you to be different than what the world says you ought to be. And it's one thing to have knowledge. And it's another thing to have an experience. We could just have knowledge about God and believe in Him, and that's okay. But when we experience God, guess what? It invokes our emotions and our feelings. I could tell you about being in an airplane, and probably most of you have been in an airplane, and and so, uh, you know, I could tell you about planes taking off and flying and landing. I've been to an airport. I've seen this happen. I know that planes fly. I know that people go up and people come down and people live. And, you know, it's okay. You can, I, I've, I've watched his planes fly 30,000 or 37,000 feet overhead. And, you know, I, I, I can see that. But when you've experienced that takeoff and your chest falls down into your drawers, <laughs> you know, whoosh. And when you come down for that landing, or, and, you, and all of a sudden those flaps come up and you're like, <laughs> there's an experience there. Or when you're at 37,000 feet and you're looking down on, on cities, and th when you experience that, it invokes your emotions. Guess what? God wants you to be emotional about him. I want to experience him in my depths. Too many Christians know about God. They are saved. They're going to heaven. But they've never experienced God. They know that God saved them from sin. And they're happy about that. And it's a good thing to be happy about. But that's all they've got. They've never experienced God. And the Lord's Prayer is asking for an experience with God. Do you want to know why some Christians are, are excited and they're clapping and they're singing and they're dancing and they're expressive? It's because they've had this experience with God. And when they feel this presence of God, they just get excited and they want to clap and they want to dance and they want to sing. Do you know why some feel this presence of the Lord and they begin just to cry? They're overcome with emotion. It's because they've had this tremendous experience with God and their emotions are attached to this experience. I just don't know about God anymore. I've experienced him and my emotions are attached to that. I was reminded at Bible study, and thanks Bruce uh, for this on, on Wednesday night, that we just don't want to see the hand of God and sometimes we're just happy with the hand of God. But Bruce reminded us that we need to see the face of God. Why? Because it's in the face of God you see his emotions. You begin to love as he loves and you begin to care as he cares and you begin to feel as he feels. And Jesus was an emotional God on earth. Do you know that sometimes he got frustrated even with his own disciples? Do you know that he walked into a temple and he began to just flip over the tables, he experienced a little bit of maybe anger at that moment, just flipping them over and, and driving them out. Get out of here. This is a house of prayer, and you made it a den of thieves. Do you know that there's scriptures where Jesus was rejoicing, and then there's scriptures where Jesus was crying. He cried over Jerusalem. When Lazarus was being raised from the dead, or just before he raised Lazarus from the dead, he weeps because of, he sees all of their unbelief, and he cries. This Christian life is more than just knowledge, and it's an experience with God, and hallowed be thy name. I want to experience you, God, in my utmost, or sorry, in my... Uh, utmost holy, holiest. 
right inside me. I don't know about you. Have you experienced God tonight? Have you had that experience? Many of the fruits of the Spirit are linked to our emotions. Love. That's an emotion, isn't it? Joy. Peace. Kindness. Gentleness. Here's one that you all love. Patience. Goodness. Have you ever seen that the fruits of the Spirit are linked to our emotions? God is an emotional God. He's asking you, he's saying, I want you to experience me. It's okay to be emotional. It's okay to dance and sing. And it's okay to cry. And it's okay to have an experience deep on the inside with me. Every time we say the Lord's Prayer, our Father, O Thou who gives me my bare breath, who art in heaven, you fill the realms of sound, light, and vibration. Hallowed be your name. Let me experience you in the deepest part of me. That's all we're going to go tonight. Isn't that good? The Lord's Prayer, we have a relational God. We have a God that's with us. He's not separated from us. We have a God that is to be experienced. And it's okay to pray for an experience with God. Because truthfully, an experience is way better than knowledge. I can know about flying and going up an airplane. But man, to experience that takeoff makes me want to get my pilot's license now because I want to experience from the cockpit. Do it myself. Take off. Come in for a landing. I can know about it. But it's way better to experience it. Do you know why? You can always question your knowledge. But you can't question your experience. Your experience is your truth. And when you experience God, He becomes your truth. Amen.